I think you can begin, Avesh. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody that is uh, joining us. Thank you for coming. Um, I would like to, to welcome everybody to this webinar organized by Cultural Survival that is titled Back to Our Roots, Indigenous Food Solutions. Um, to start, as it is our tradition within Indigenous cultures, we would like to give the floor to uh, to everybody. Thank you. Uh, let us pray. Korangi ko papa ko puta ko rongo ko tane mahuta ko tanga roa ko tu matauenga ko homia tike tike ko tafiri matia toko na te rangi kirunga ko papa kiraro ka puta te ira tangata ki te faia o ki te ao marama tihei mauri ora. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tui. Um, thank you for joining a cultural survival today. A cultural Survival is uh, advocates an organization that advocates for indigenous people's rights and supports indigenous communities, self-determination, cultures, and the political resilience since 1972. We are a global indigenous-led organization and our director is Galina Angarova Buria, from the Buryat Nation. We are right now at nine months from the start of the pandemic in the world in Wuhan. And protecting each other, such as protecting each other with the mask, is now the new norm. We had forgotten this value, for, this value for many years, for many decades, if not centuries, as the paradigm of urbanization, accumulation, massive industrialization, globalization, exploitation, and depletion of natural resources became the norm. We forgot that protecting each other, caring from each other, and not only humans, but also plants and animals, is the, is, are some of the teachings that humans were given by ancestors and deities or are in the ethical codes of many cultures around the world. It's just that we have forgotten. Indigenous peoples have, are suffering this pandemic greatly as they do not have access to healthcare in urban centers and some have compromised immune system due to changes in diets that come with from an, an aggressive globalized and industrialized food that come from the and also the contamination of waters and lands. At the same time, indigenous communities have shown to the world their resilience by strengthening their own systems of family and community care and family and community and self-government. Another way of protecting themselves, indigenous communities, are increasing the use of traditional medicine and strengthening of food systems. We know that food insecurity is one of the causes of vulnerability of populations uh, with this pandemic. Both food and herbal medicine systems reflect and feed indigenous identity, ancestral knowledge, spiritual connection to the land and ways of living of indigenous communities for thousands of years to the present. We just published our last issue of the Cultural Survival Quarterly, which you can see here in the screen, uh, and is on indigenous food solutions. Now we will have the opportunity to listen to indigenous leaders around the world that are showing the way, showing by example, how to return to the land, how to return to a sustainable and balanced relationship with animals and plants that nourish us. We will hear the perspectives from the Kametsa, Maori, Inuit and Ethiopian communities and their great work in agroecology, resource management, eco-businesses, and herbal medicine. Some speakers today have also written articles for the Cultural Survival Quarterly, and we invite you to check it out. We have our agenda today, and um, some housekeeping information is please keep your microphones muted. Uh, also, uh, if you have your cell phones, if you are speaking, when it comes to the speakers, to keep your phone uh, in silent, please. Uh, the order of the presentations are the following. First, we're going to have four panelists, Milion Bele, Tui Shortland, Jesus Wakiboy, and Verde uh, Anabogok. And then we will have a period of questions and answers. So to start, we will have our first presenter, and that's Milion Bele. I have the pleasure to introduce him. He is the general coordinator of the Alliance of Food Sovereignty in Africa. 
Milion Belay is an expert and advocate for forestry conservation, indigenous livelihoods, and food and sea sovereignty. The Alliance works in 50 of 55 African countries. Milion is interested and focuses on intergenerational knowledge transfer and the use of participatory mapping of, uh, for social learning, identity building, and mobilization of memory. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can uh, use your screen, Bele. Thank you so much, uh, Bele, please. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you, Galina. I, I know Galina uh, when she was working with the SWIFT Foundation. And um, I'm so happy to see Tui also. We have been in a lot of <laughs> spaces together. Um, well, I am the general coordinator of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Uh, as Coach uh, T said, um, it's the biggest uh, alliance in Africa. It's the biggest uh, group working on food systems. Um, it's composed of you know indigenous communities, indigenous peoples' networks, uh, farmers' networks, pastoralist networks, fisher folk networks. Um, Faith-based institutions, women networks, youth networks, consumer networks, civil society groups. It's a big, big, big alliance. And we work uh, in 50 of the 55 African countries. We work on seed issue. You know, we work with two hands. On one hand, we fight with the appropriation of our life, our land, our seed, our water, our culture. Uh, but on another hand also, we make a proposal. Our proposal is agroecology. I will explain why we are, have opted for agroecology and why agroecology is a way. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, the recognition to agroecology is increasing in world policy spaces and uh, in world uh, practical spaces too. Um, let me talk about uh, food security. I think uh, I heard Koiti say about food security. The term that we prefer mostly is food sovereignty. So what's the difference between food security and food security? I will, I will speak uh, about it a little bit. Food security, uh, I, I'm not going to go to the history of the coming of the world, but it talks about availability availability of food. Even the concept of food security has come because of the food availability, because food was not available and governments were responsible for making sure that food is available. And then the question of access came because, you know, food can be available, but it cannot be, it may not be accessible both physically and financially. And later came the concept of usefulness, you know, even if it is accessible, then it has to be useful. Then um, the, con the concept of uh, stability came in, you know, it has to be there all the time. But now the definition has grown and it includes um, sustainability and agency also. Agency meaning that, you know, communities, you can, you can uh, bring food to people and make it accessible, but they have to produce their own food. Um, what is the, the, the problem with food security is uh, it is politically insensitive. It, it, it doesn't concern itself uh, on how and where the food is produced. Um, uh, but there is another also idea, which is the right to food. Right to food is a very important concept because um, um, uh, governments you know, as a duty bearers have responsibility to make sure that uh, all the lists that I, I suggested about uh, food security is ensured, accessibility, stability, availability. So governments are involved when right to food is uh, included. Uh, but the problem also with the right to food is in food security is also governments are trying to make uh, food available and accessible using um, methods which are not um, gentle to nature, uh, which are also abusive of the land in the life of indigenous people in local communities. Uh, basically, I'm talking about industrial agriculture. So uh, the, the number of uh, indigenous groups, uh, activists have opted for another concept, 
a concept of food sovereignty, which is uh, very much a political agenda. Um, what's the difference between food security and food sovereignty? I think basically we can talk about three differences. Uh, food sovereignty talks about the cultural appropriateness of food. Uh, food is basically a cultural property. It's not uh, a commodity, as we always say. Um, you know, it's, it's knowledge-based. Uh, you go to a, any part of the world, you know, people have their own way of producing food and, and um, storing food using spice. I always use uh, my mother as, a, as an expert in food preparation, also in food storage. The number of spices that she uses for uh, preparing food uh, is astounding, you know. A lot of people can make some certain sauces, but the way she makes it is, is different. And that comes from, from her culture. So the cultural appropriateness of food is very much important. Another difference is that, you know, food sovereignty is concerned about how the food is produced. Is it produced by harming the environment, the biosphere in general, the weather, wild animals, wild plants? Um, you know, all these, are they affected? That's a very, very important question to ask. Because in the, in the case of food uh, uh, security, food can come from anywhere else and you can still have food. But in uh, food sovereignty, how the food is produced is very, very critical. We can uh, use COVID as an example, you know, how food is produced can really um, be the source of the pandemic, uh, even the biggest pandemic that we have ever seen is related somehow to how food is produced, as we know. Uh, the other differences in terms of uh, rights, you know, the rights approach, um, who has a right for the economic aspects of their food? Um, this this uh, linkage with the local markets, uh, linkage with the local business, uh, ownership of the market, ownership of the land, um, rights of women, you know, rights of youth, rights of marginalized people, indigenous people, all that comes in food sovereignty. That's a very, very critical in terms of food sovereignty. So for us, in terms of a narrative, we go for the narrative of agroecology. Uh, how is agroecology different as a narrative than, you know, high input agriculture or industrial agriculture? because agroecology believes that people know, it's based on uh, people's knowledge. Um, agroecology believes that the seeds that people ha have in their hand can still be enhanced. It's not romanticizing everything, you know, but the seeds that people have, can, can, we can increase the value of the seed, we can enhance productivity. Conventional scientists, indigenous uh, scientists can work together to make seeds better. There are a number of land management practices and we don't have to give our land to land grabbers or to outside bodies to produce more. We can produce more if we focus on our seed. Uh, that's very critical for agroecology and we can support that through science. Uh, um, agroecology is, uh, you know, the, 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 the three pillars, one of the pillars of agroecology is science, cutting edge science. Uh, uh, we have to recognize that also. And social movement, since this is a political agenda, since there is an, an, an appropriation of our land, our seed and our life, then everything becomes political. And um, we have to counter this through social movements. So for that reason, uh, agroecology is a proper uh, way of galvanizing local community and addressing the transition to a better uh, food system in general. Can agroecology work? You know, in uh, 2013, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa said, ask it ourselves, you ask it ourselves, does agroecology work? Or especially in our context in Africa. So to find out, we started to collect cases. So we collect cases from, um, you know, about uh, 40 African countries uh, more than 60 cases, 
And uh, one of the cases comes from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, can I quickly show you uh, this case? Yes, um, the, the area is called Tigray, as you could see, it's, it's degraded, um, it's high overgrazing uh, and burning, deep wide and long erosion gullies, low soil garlic matter, low soil fertility, serious food security in dry areas. Uh, during the famine, the famous Ethiopian famine, it, thousands have died in this area, in other areas of Ethiopia too, but uh, uh, more so in this area. So. We have two ways of addressing this. One way is pumping the soil through with chemicals and bringing a, a high input, uh, I mean, hybrid seeds uh, and also following other land management techniques. But what we opted to do is to rehabilitate the land. This is a rehabilitated land. Uh, the hillside was, you know, we, we planted uh, uh, different kinds of uh, grasses and trees, as Hispania and the three uh, long, I mean, uh, long grasses were, 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 uh, were uh, planted here and they've grown very well. The gullies has, have healed, there is a pond here. These are rehabilitated gullies. Composted field growing there when we, we tend uh, and the barley in a faba bean here. So this is a long year uh, over 20 years, I think this project has close to 30 years uh, life uh, and every year data is collected and uh, there is a comparison across the crops. And this diagram is a very, very powerful diagram for me. Um, as you can see, there are the, the green is a check, meaning the blue, I mean, meaning there is no uh, artificial fertilizer or there is no compost. The brown one is a land, a farmland treated with compost. The green one was, is with, with artificial fertilizers. And these five crops that you see are very critical for Ethiopian food. Barley, durum wheat, you know, we have over 100 varieties of wheat. I don't know whether you know that or not. Barley, we have over 60 varieties of barley in Ethiopia, maize, uh, uh, maybe diverse, but not as equal. F, uh, we have over 90 variety of, uh, bar, uh, F varieties. This is a typical Ethiopian crop. And fava bean, all the crops are very much important. So there was data collected across these five critical uh, crops. And um, as you can see, well, for the first year and second year, um, the, the land treated with chemical fertilizer did very well uh, because you know it's like giving some injection, you know, pa grows. Uh, but over the years, the land treated with compost did very well in all of the critical crops in Ethiopia. So actually, agroecology works. I can tell you now. I don't have time, but I can tell you now, cases and after cases of um agroecological practices working and what we did do was we did uh, a meta-analysis of this uh, uh 60 over 60 cases and compare them with the 17 sustainable development goals and i actually meet uh, uh 12 of the 17 this system sustainable development goals 12 of them when i did make a presentation of this case uh and Yale University, and so the students asked me, why not the 17 of them? I do actually agree with them. I think it, it, uh, they touch uh, every one of the sustainable development goals. So agroecology can actually address all of these uh, development goals. So in general, that, uh, that's what uh, I wanted to say. I don't know how much time I have. Otherwise I can tell you about cases Fine, fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Milion. And thank you for these uh, excellent examples of, of success stories in agroecology. Um, our next presenter is Twee Shortland, the Twee Shortland.
And thank you so much for the wonderful play, prayer at the beginning to eat. Uh, to Shortland is Maori from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and a board member with Cultural Survival. Uh, she's director of the Te Kopu Pacific Indigenous and Local Knowledge Center of Distinction. She currently assists eco business development and helps indigenous organizations to provide pioneering services in traditional livelihoods, cultural impact assessments, and cultural environmental monitoring. Uh, Tui is the founder of Awatea Organics, specializing in, in cultivating indigenous food sovereignty from her ancestral land. Tui, the floor is yours. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, thank you. It's lovely to be here. And uh, it's lovely to have an update too of um, how you're all progressed and everything in Africa. And you've always been such an inspiration. So thank you for that. It's good to connect again. And I'd love to talk more about all of our projects that we're doing. And um, I'm sorry, I'm on my uh, my uh, daughter's computer and so I have to use the, our Facebook page where we put all of our photos up and um, so it'll just give you a little idea of our little small world here and uh, what we're doing and I'll uh, talk as we go as well. Here we go. Oh hang on a minute, sorry. How do I do this? One moment, here we go. So, um, this is just a picture here on, on the left of uh, this morning. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, a 165-acre uh, Māori land block here, north of Auckland. Uh, so we're two hours north of Auckland in Whangarei City. And uh, we're quite subtropical here. Uh, we're right in the centre of the industrial zone of uh, Whangarei. So if you hear smashing glass and things like that, that's because we're right next to the city dump. Um, we grow food, seed and medicine here in an agroecological way based on uh, indigenous practices as a way to reconnect people back to the land. Uh, it's a project that we started two years ago and um, we share most of uh, how to grow and how to save seed and different practices and grow the networks mostly via um, our Facebook page. Um, and we hold, we, we received some funding recently from Pawanka. I must say thank you to them and acknowledge them because they really helped us this year to kick off uh, our mentoring of other Indigenous farmers and uh, the creation of resources. Uh, by the end of the year, we'll have a book and a video uh, done as well. So um, that's a little bit about um, the project this year. Um, just a little bit of history perhaps of Aotearoa and um, the colonization of our way of life in terms of growing our food in our indigenous ways. Uh, before colonization, like around the, the in 1840, the Treaty of Te Tiriti o Waitangi was signed with uh, the colonial government, with uh, the British government. And uh, before the signing of Te Tiriti, we were living in harmony. We were coming into our agricultural revolution here in Aotearoa. Uh, you know, as Polynesians, we've been uh, trading food across Asia, Pacific, and through Latin America as well for thousands of years. And so some of the food that we grow here in our uh, mara, in our um, gardens, our cultivations, uh, is food that has we've had a relationship with for two and a half thousand years, such as the Tuttle. And we've traveled all around the Pacific to uh, gather the food that is best suited to our way of life and uh, best suited to giving nutrients and co-evolving with us as food. This Here's one example here. Um, this is our native 
squash. It's uh, this color when it when it um, is harvested, and so we can store it really well. And the seeds in there are still good as well. And there's hundreds of seeds in there because, as we know, the plants give a multiplicity of seed back to us, and so they teach us about abundance and they teach us about generosity and um, they teach us about sharing as well so you know we we acknowledge here in Aotearoa that our, a lot of our food our greens came through from Asia and our pirifiru, uh as well come from Latin America and we we're growing these seeds out here um, at Awatea on uh, the land. We have a bit of a seed security issue here because uh, after colonization there were still big records of really big huge community gardens run by um, the communities, the whānau, the hapu, the family, the tribes and uh, so the British uh, government went about uh, establishing the confiscation of lands. And these days there's very little land left that is still in Māori hands. And so the ability to grow food uh, for your community is really uh, an access issue and it's a land rights issue as well, um, as we'll see previously. So... Um, we're battling industrial agriculture as well. Those chemicals that came from the war that needed to be distributed around and traded, they came here as well. And there are a lot of contaminated places and contaminated waterways. And so these are the things also that we're advocating around is how you can restore uh, waterways and you can, can restore the land as well. So uh, I'm just going to see if I can change this. Oh, that's, yeah, no, that's off from there. Here we go. One of the things that we're also doing is we're developing tools. So uh, here we've we've pulled out around an acre of um, land, broken it in, and now we're growing an abundance of heritage traditional foods. And uh, it's a research place. Uh, we know that every generation of growing seed, that that seed is going to be more resilient. And uh, all of our heritage seed from our squash to our potatoes, our sweet potatoes and our greens, we're growing out the seed to the point that we can start to distribute it to other indigenous growers who hold the same respect and customs around the seed. So they can grow it out and they can be sustainable in their own um, communities and also share and trade seed. Uh, so one of the ways that we're trying to encourage people to grow again, like not only are we in many ways um, alienated from our lands and alienated from the knowledge of living on our lands and growing our food, but also the abundance of it. And uh, so we develop tools like this is a harvest succession calendar. So in the centre, it shows you uh, when you plant your seed. And this is based in here in our region uh, for our climate and soil, of course. But, um, and then it tells you which months in the middle, in the blue, uh, when you need to transplant your seed into the ground, uh, into the earth. And then the green on the outside is uh, when you can harvest. And so most people will look, you know, straight to, oh, when can I harvest? And they don't realise that they actually we can grow some potatoes, some Māori potatoes all year round, you know. And and this food is, is so super good for us and high nutrients that we don't need to, uh, you know, be locked into the colonial system of going to work um, in the industries and never see your families because you can't afford food and you can't afford uh, the living costs here. And so, um, yeah, these are just some of the examples of what we do. Uh, here at Te Rewa Rewa, because we are uh, central, we're very fortunate, um, one of the last Māori land blocks uh, here. And so there are a lot of whānau that are living in the city here. And so this is also an opportunity for them to be able to 
uh, come and share knowledge and hopefully be inspired and take away some seed or take away some seedlings, um, particularly food now as well. During the COVID uh, lockdowns, it really sparked a lot of interest uh, in communities around food security. And some have realised in the north that when Auckland, uh, Auckland has the ability to take food and not send food north. And so um, now it's time, you know, it's a critical time and it's a great time that everybody has this interest in growing again. And uh, we know that getting this food into the bellies of our people will keep them healthy. And so uh, having to line up, and, and we were still lining up recently for food from the countdowns and the big, um, you know, supermarkets and things like that, that drive the, you know, a part of the industrial food system. Uh, some people lined up for hours during the COVID. And so this drives us even more to um, carry on the work. And it's great to meet others who understand that this work, you need to do it with your hands, you know, very much with your hands and um, get out there into under the sun, which is great for you as well. And maybe a little less intellect and a little more heart as well. And, and working with other farmers, there's a natural inclination to innovate you know, and a natural curiosity to see, oh, there's, you know, my seed looks a little bit different here. Maybe if I save that seed and I start developing that in a way, then, you know, that might be an interesting creation as well. And so the beauty and the creativity of uh, Indigenous agroecology, you know, is something that we try to attract people to as well and change the face of farming here in Aotearoa and around the world. So thank you very much. It's just a small presentation. I was trying to scroll down on the Facebook, but I'm really, I'm no, not really that tech uh, savvy. So thank you very much, Kia ora. Thank you so much, Tui. Thank you. And our next presenter is Berne Anabagak. A Verne is Inupiaq from King Guillin, otherwise, otherwise known as Wales, Alaska, a village located in the Seward Peninsula of Alaska and the westernmost point of American mainland. She currently resides in Anchorage, Alaska, and is the Cultural Sustainability Advisor of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, ICC, Alaska office in the United States. The ICC is an international non-government organization that represents approximately 180,000 Inuit uh, across Alaska in the US, Canada, Greenland, and Chukotka in Russia. Um, just give me a second, I'm going to share my screen for, um, for Bernice's presentation. Thank you for inviting me to share our culture with you and the work we are doing to advance Inuit food security and food sovereignty. Just uh, mention that uh, we do ask that any information concepts or points that are shared in this presentation that may be later used, we ask that they are referenced to this presentation or any reports that we highlight within. My name is Verne Angnavagak. I am from Kingigin, also known as Wales, Alaska. I'm the Cultural Sustainability Advisor in the Inuit Circumpolar Council, Alaska office. And next slide. The Inuit Circumpolar Council, or also known as ICC, was founded in 1977 by Eben Hopson Sr. from Utkalvik, Alaska. 
His vision was to unite all Inuit to address issues of common concern with one voice. Today, ICC advocates on behalf of 180,000 Inuit across Chikaka, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. The principal goals of ICC are to strengthen unity among Inuit of the circumpolar region, to promote the rights and interests, our rights and interests on an international level, to develop and encourage long-term policies that safeguard the Arctic environment, and to seek full and active partnership in the political, economic, and social development of circumpolar regions. This is Inuit Nunat. This is our homeland, the homeland of Inuit. And I'm from a very, a very, um, the very tip of the middle point that's highlighted red in on the Alaska part of the map. Um, that is where I come from. Um, next slide. Before I go into the relationship between food security and food sovereignty, I wanted to share with you a visual of our Inuit ecosystem. This is what Inuit Nunat or Inuit homelands look like through our cultural lens. This ecosystem puzzle was collectively developed by Alaskan Inuit and comes from the ICC Alaska Food Security Conceptual Framework, how to assess the Arctic from an Inuit perspective. Inuit pay close attention to the interlinking pieces, as you can see um, in this puzzle, which are continuously needing to adjust to one another. When others talk about food security, they are often talking about nutrition or physical and economic needs for food. For Inuit, however, we are talking about much more than that. We are talking about our entire ecosystem in which we are a part of. We are talking about our culture, our way of life, and our knowledge. Many pieces make up our ecosystem, including our language, our knowledge, our sharing of foods, hunting, dancing, feasting, celebrations, and much more. All these pieces are needed to be understood in order to know what is happening in the Arctic and to understand what food security means to us. However, as you can see in the middle, there is a piece of the puzzle being broken out and we often reference Refer, reference that um, when talking about some of the challenges or problems that occur when somebody comes and decides to just take that one piece of the puzzle and study just that to make policy recommendations or decisions about what happens in our homelands without realizing the cumulative impacts or um, what happens to the other interlinking pieces. And in order to understand what is happening in the Arctic and in order for our ecosystem to be healthy, it's necessary for us to pay attention to the relationships between the components that are making up our whole ecosystem. And in that way, we look at it holistically. Next slide. Through this work, through the Food Security Project, um, Inuit also developed our own definition for food security. Because food security is a lifeline to our culture and reflects the health of our entire ecosystem, I'm going to take some time to read this definition to you all as it encompasses everything that food security means to us and it is a basis for the work that we continue to do today. Food security is the right, the natural right of all Inuit to be a part of the ecosystem, to access food, to take care, to caretake, protect and respect all of life, land, water and air. It allows for all Inuit to obtain, process, store and consume sufficient amounts of healthy and nutritious preferred food, food that are physically and spiritually craved and needed from the land, air, and water, which provide our families and future generations 
through the practice of Inuit customs and spirituality, language, knowledge, policies, management practices, and self-governance. It includes the responsibility and ability to pass on knowledge to younger generations, the taste of traditional foods rooted in place and season, knowledge of how to safely obtain and prepare traditional foods for medicinal use, clothing, housing, nutrients, and overall how to be in one's environment. Food security includes the recognition that food is a lifeline and a connection between the past and today's self and cultural identity. Inuit food security is characterized by environmental health, it is made up of six interconnecting dimensions. I'll go into those a little bit further in the next slide. Um, and before we move into the realm of food sovereignty, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide first and I'll talk a little bit more about um, this framework. So through the Food Security Project, Inuit developed this framework. Um, it's called the Food Security Conceptual Framework. This conceptual framework shares all of the components that are needed to make up food security. This is our drum. Because the drum is an important element of our culture, it was chosen to hold together the conceptual framework. In the center, you can see we have food security and food security is characterized by environmental health. Our environment, our whole environment. Surrounding that are six dimensions that are needed in order to have a healthy environment. And those are the availability, Inuit culture, decision-making power and management, health and wellness, stability, and accountability. Our environment is considered healthy when all of the aspects of that environment fit together, where there is concern not only for the health and wellness of our people, but also at the same time, the health and wellness of our animals, of our land and water, and all of life. Surrounding that are the tools we need to keep stability in those six dimensions that we also need to ensure they are interlinked and they are maintaining cohesion with each other. If any of the pieces of these are removed, we will not have food security. The tools that are needed to support this are knowledge sources, policy, and true co-management. We know that um, the definition of Inuit food security holds the understanding that without food sovereignty, food security will not exist. As you can see, accessibility is a part of food security. And when we're talking about health and wellness, how our people are dealing and responding to the COVID pandemic, how our people are mentally and physically well or unwell, all of this ties back to the importance of communities being able to continue our way of life, which is um, grounded in hunting, gathering, and living off of our land and our water. It's crucial in order to continue to practice this even during the pandemic for our people to go out and gather our food because it not only sustains our people physically, mentally, and spiritually, but it also is an opportunity for us to continue our culture, for us to pass knowledge on to the next generation. For some Inuit, they will be celebrating their first catch, which signifies a rite of passage, where a hunter is no longer being provided for and now will be responsible to help provide food for their family. For us, um, hunting, fishing, and gathering is a means for cultural sustainability. It's about self-determination. And as someone mentioned earlier, um, there are different gender roles. And I feel like it's important that we understand different gender roles are held through different cultures. And for Inuit, there's a strong partnership between men and women who both contribute to providing food for our families. And it's also important to note that many, although we are Inuit under one umbrella, it, uh, 
across four different countries, um, we are one people, yet we still experience at the community level different practices and different uh, understandings of roles of where men and women contribute. Some men and women both contribute to hunting. Some both contribute to putting away our food. Um, it's more about the community and sharing is an important element of our culture that's tied to food security. And often in time, we have successful hunters and their families that are not only providing for their family, but also providing for elder, elders, widows, single parents, and others who are not able to provide for their families. And prior to the Cold War and prior to Inuit permanent settlement locations, Inuit moved freely and traded freely where there were no imposed borders. However, in management today, we often come across regulations that impose single catch bag limits or are only designed for families to catch for themselves. This doesn't, does not support our culture and is only reflective of another culture and their values. As earlier mentioned, our food security requires flexibility between and within all elements of our ecosystem. When we harvest salmon, for example, we are continuously adapting to our environment. We're taking into account whether when drying our fish, the weather when drying our fish, if it's raining, if there is enough wind. However, when regulations conflict with our knowledge, with our indigenous knowledge, it does not support our food security. In this sense, regulations need to be flexible to take into the account the timing of when the fishnets need to be pulled out of the water, when openings and closings are made, what penalties or fines will be issued and to who. When we consider management decisions or trade-off decisions, and who is being asked to change their behavior, it's most often our people with decisions being made by a dominant culture far away from our communities who are often in time are utilizing one system of knowledge without understanding the implications on our culture or way of life. We are resilient and we are always adapting to change. It's important to mention that Management is not a new concept for us and is something that Inuit have been practicing since time immemorial. And we are seeing now that the Arctic environment is changing rapidly and we need to be able to be flexible and adaptive when management decisions are made in order for us to make those decisions quick enough and in order for us to survive, in order for our hunters to be out safe while out hunting in order for us to put food away for the winter. When Inuit manage our resources, we are considering our entire environment with a strong focus on the relationship between components. And we realize that our animals and our resources have no borders. Management is done holistically through a food security lens. And that can be realized through this slide and the previous slide that I shared that helps kind of visualize what food security means to us and how it is holistic and interconnected with all of the pieces um, weighing very, very much important to each other. Within management, we also realize that language is crucial to management, that our language has many words for our animals that describes them in their different stages of life and even in their health. In our culture, our relationship with our environment is reciprocal, where our people depend on the bowhead well, our culture depends on the bowhead well, which is just important as the relationship that the bowhead well has with us. And this is the same for any other species, for walrus, for seals, for fish, for the berries, everything um, that we have a relationship with. So we're always grounded back to the food security conceptual framework, to the drum and working to ensure, to secure food security and to advance food sovereignty. Let's see, sorry, I lost my spot for a second. Um, 
we through the work that we're doing we hope to regain recognition and respect of our rights to access and manage our wildlife and other resources in Alaska and across Inuit Nunaat to ensure that we can progress towards this collective aspiration for international collaboration on wildlife management. And in order to get there, our office at the ICC Alaska office has been engaged in a couple of different projects. Um, we just are wrapping up a uh, food sovereignty and self-governance, Inuit role in managing Arctic resources, and have just released the FSSG report. And that report and that work focuses on what impedes or supports our food sovereignty through a co-management comparison between Alaska and the Inuvialuit settlement region of Canada. When we are looking very closely at the issue and working with Inuit across Alaska and across the circumpolar, we realize that it's very clear that the lack of decision-making power in management is still the number one driver of Inuit food insecurity. Whether we are talking about climate change, conservation, protected areas, it comes back to decision-making and looking at whose values are being at put at the forefront of decisions that are made within our homelands. And when we talk about going back to our roots and indigenous food solutions, it is everything we are aspiring to do. Another project I quickly want to mention before I conclude here is the Alaskan Inuit Food Sovereignty Initiative. This is an initiative that I am facilitating the work of and is centered on creating a movement to unify and organize Alaskan Inuit with the ultimate goal of developing an Alaskan Inuit Food Sovereignty Management Action Plan that advances food sovereignty across our four regions of Alaska, across the North Slope, the Northwest Arctic, the Bering Strait, and the yukon Kuskokwim regions of Alaska. This action plan is a political action plan. It's still under development. Um, and our aim is that the action plan will empower our people to seek reform and justice and to collectively work towards securing access and management rights over our traditional food resources to create long-term systematic policy change. And on, on the last note, I just wanted to mention that true co-management with Inuit would be an equitable partnership between Inuit and the government in resource management, that the partnership has to be built on trust. It has to be respecting and upholding indigenous rights and where we have mutual decision-making power and that we see this as a overall way to improve the management of our resources and to ensure our cultural sustainability and to improve conservation. Go ahead to the next slide. Sorry, there's one last slide. Um, I don't know what happened. I'm not seeing it. But anyways, the last slide just thanks everybody. Kuyana, um, thank you for having us here and to share a little bit about our culture, about the issues we face, about the work that we're doing. And um, please visit our website at www.iccalaska.org to find out more about the projects that we are doing, more about the work that we are doing and the report, um, the FSSG report that was recently released as well as other reports that we've released that um, contribute to the work that we're doing and kind of explain it a little bit more into detail. And we hope that is helpful for everybody. Thank you so much, Bernie. And apologies for that shift in the in the presentation. Thank you. So we are having our last presenter. We have Jesus Guajiboy, and he's a traditional healer, a teacher, and a traditional authority in his community. Uh, his community is the Kametsa people of the municipality of Sinunboy in Putumayo, Colombia. Uh, he has been the founder of bilingual education schools. He has held several positions uh, at the municipal and regional levels uh, when it comes to indigenous government. He is also a member of the network of indigenous people's human rights defenders and also um, continues to use traditional medicine um, to, to protect the people in the period of COVID 
and I'm going to give the floor to Jesus. Adelante, Jesús. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Un saludo y un abrazo a todos mis hermanos. A todos mis hermanos indígenas del mundo y a la sociedad que en este momento nos escucha. Yo quiero invocar a mis seres queridos, a la madre naturaleza, pedir permiso que me ilumine, pedir permiso a los astros, al agua, a la luna, a las estrellas y a la misma madre naturaleza que en este momento me posee, que me ilumine para compartir conocimientos a todos mis hermanos y al mundo. Yo quiero empezar hablando cuando hablamos de seguridad alimentaria, tenemos que hablar primero de nuestro territorio, de la madre naturaleza. Y es diciendo que el territorio en primer lugar ligada prácticamente con la madre naturaleza. La madre naturaleza es la mujer, la mujer, una dama que nos cría, que nos da los alimentos. Por eso para los pueblos indígenas de Colombia y el mundo consideramos a la madre naturaleza como sujeto social de derecho. Ella en este momento está sintiendo, está respirando y ella la que nos comunique, nos emite los mensajes a nosotros, sus hijos. Diciendo que uno como hombre, como ser humano, nosotros antes de pisar la madre naturaleza, Estuvimos nueve meses en el vientre materno de esa mujer tan linda de carne y hueso. En ese momento, cuando estuvimos en el vientre materno, prácticamente empezó el niño a disfrutar de la seguridad alimentaria. De esa alimentación que le suministraba la mamá, Allí disfrutamos la seguridad alimentaria y, y el seguro alimento. Porque la madre que en ese momento empezó a tomar alimento por adentro, ya estábamos disfrutando la seguridad alimentaria. En ese transcurrir de los nueve meses, nos estábamos, estuvimos alimentándonos en esa casa sagrada que se llama el vientre materno. Y esa mamita nuestra se estaba alimentando de todas las bondades, de todas las bondades que produce la madre naturaleza. Una vez que nacimos del vientre de la madre naturaleza, inmediatamente nos fuimos al otro vientre natural que en este momento estamos disfrutando. Estamos disfrutando ¿por qué? Porque la madre es nuestra madre que nos posee, nos alimenta, nos protege, nos ilumina y nos brinda las bondades que la madre naturaleza, el vientre materno natural que hoy en día estamos aquí estamos disfrutando. De tal manera, cuando el hombre indígena o el hombre nació y llegó a este mundo, encontró la madre naturaleza totalmente ordenada. Pero desafortunadamente, los mandos medios vinieron a desordenar. Pero nosotros, a medida que, que hemos aparecido aquí, el hombre indígena, empezamos a hacer, a convivir con ella, a hablar de paz, de armonía, de delicadeza. Por eso nosotros en cada momento, en cada instante, 
mantenemos una constante comunicación con la madre naturaleza. De ahí que en el momento que nacemos, somos el cordón umbilical entre la naturaleza, hombre y espacio. Y esa eh, gente infantil. Así es que nosotros estamos íntimamente relacionados la madre naturaleza. Ella es la que nos guía, la que nos ayuda a organizar nuestro proyecto de vida. Por eso hablamos de proyecto de vida, el plan integral de vida, el plan integral de salvaguardia, el plan especial de salvaguardia, y ahí tenemos que hablar prácticamente de nuestra seguridad y la soberanía alimentaria. La madre ha sido constante, la madre, la madre indígena, en Colombia habemos 115 pueblos indígenas, entre ellos solamente estamos hablando uno que es el pueblo Camsá de acá del occidente de Colombia, del departamento del Putumayo. Nosotros tenemos una existencia milenaria, milenaria, porque nosotros mantenemos, somos grandes defensores de la madre naturaleza. Ella es la que nos posee, nos alimenta. Cuando nosotros sembramos, Siempre manejamos las fases de la luna. Por eso la mujer es la prototipo del desarrollo del jaján. Jaján es un espacio donde sembramos toda clase de alimentos. Incluso sembramos las plantas medicinales y las plantas protectoras de nuestro territorio. Pero desafortunadamente, como la mujer indígena es la prototipo del jaján, los gobiernos desafortunadamente son, estas mujercitas son discriminadas, invisibilizadas. No hay apoyo del gobierno para fortalecer el papel que vienen desempeñando las mujeres. Ellas son las que guardan las semillas, las que guardan la comida, las dueñas del jaján las dueñas de la, de la seguridad alimentaria, porque en Colombia tenemos aproximadamente 33 mil variedades de maíz, 25 mil variedades de trigo, y así una serie, una serie de, de productos que produce el jajal. Y como yo decía anteriormente que trabajamos con, la, con, la, con las fases de la luna, aquí tenemos un cuadro para indicar no sé si, 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 si se puede decir si se ¿Sí? ¿Sí? Este es el calendario normal que nosotros manejamos para que ellos lo hagan y para mantener la seguridad. Pero nosotros somos... porque trabajamos por, por épocas. Por ejemplo, en este mes, en este mes de, de, de septiembre, trabajamos para mantener la seguridad alimentaria a unos meses que viene la hambruna. Por eso todo el tiempo hay comida, todo el tiempo hay alimento, todo el tiempo hay disposición. Eso es prácticamente la seguridad alimentaria para los pueblos indígenas. Y la calidad de alimento es cuando el, el, el hermano indígena, el ser humano, dispone sin ninguna contaminación. Son limpios los alimentos. Por eso nosotros somos enemigos de los insumos químicos, porque envenena, intoxica y trata de... de acabar con la fertilidad de la madre naturaleza. Nosotros estamos haciendo campaña a nivel nacional, a nivel de organización de las comunidades indígenas para que haya una sensibilización, una educación en la no utilización de los elementos químicos, que solamente hace es eh, envenenar y acabar con la fertilidad y en el buen comportamiento de la madre naturaleza. 
Entonces, nosotros hemos venido planteando de que la seguridad alimentaria tenemos que compartir con los demás pueblos indígenas. Si no lo tiene una comunidad, hombre, compartamos y digámosle que voy a mantener la seguridad alimentaria, las semillas tradicionales. Hoy en día, desafortunadamente, el gobierno de turno nos está imponiendo las semillas transgénicas, que solamente duran seis, un año, y al año usted tiene que comprar nuevas semillas. En cambio, nosotros estamos profiriendo de que mantengamos esa tradición, pero siempre trabajando bajo la unidad, bajo el entendimiento de todas las organizaciones. En ese campo, en ese territorio, nosotros manejamos las, las plantas. En esta pandemia, que empezó en el mes de marzo, si no recuerdo mucho, empezamos a hacer, a utilizar las plantas medicinales, el eucalipto, hacer los baños, los antisépticos, los aumedios, y empezar a atender a los niños a las madres de familia, a los campos, a los animales, a todo para protegernos eh, de la, del contagio del COVID-19. Sin embargo, la pandemia también golpeó, no solamente a los pueblos indígenas, sino también a los campesinos, porque la seguridad, la, la disposición de los alimentos ya se fue desapareciendo, acabando. Y allí fue el gran problema que nosotros tuvimos que acudir eh, a las organizaciones para que nos compartan con las semillas. Entonces, mire, es un reto para nosotros. Es un reto para el mundo para que a través de las organizaciones nosotros tengamos ese fortalecimiento de nuestra identidad, de nuestra sabiduría alimentaria, alimentaria porque la madre tierra está esperando qué le vamos a, a encargar a esta madre para seguir produciendo los alimentos, para seguir transformando, porque un alimento bien nutritivo también sana la mente, sana el espíritu y sana la energía, armoniza el equilibrio social, el equilibrio económico del, del, del hombre y dinámica de la misma persona. Entonces, eso es totalmente amplio este, eh, este tema a tratar. Nosotros, o sea, este cuarto de tiempo que nosotros tenemos no es suficiente. Es apenas un abre bocas que nosotros queremos compartir el conocimiento ancestral de nuestros taitas, de nuestros abuelos, de la madre naturaleza, el agua. Por eso nosotros decimos que somos hijos de la madre naturaleza, del agua, del viento. Del de los árboles de las artes medicinales y todo es una articulación el hombre indígena es apenas una hebra en el tejido natural los, los árboles los animales los minerales somos parte de la naturaleza por eso decimos que que la seguridad alimentaria es un es un don de la misma naturaleza, donde nosotros disponemos para que nos alimentemos y compartamos con nuestros hermanos que están sufriendo de pronto para algunas dificultades del orden natural. Entonces, la idea es de que, de que nosotros, eh, como pueblos, usamos esos planteamientos bien importantes donde la mujer indígena de verdad haga el ejercicio del empoderamiento, del empoderamiento porque ellas son las, las eh, que desempeñan ese papel protagónico de, de guardar las semillas, de mantener, de conservar todas las semillas tradicionales, tradicionales. Y eso sería importante que a nivel del mundo compartamos, compartamos aquellos, aquellas semillas. Nosotros estamos haciendo aquí en nuestro, eh, hacemos, hacemos como un pequeño encuentro nacional o internacional para fortalecer la calidad de vida de nuestros conciudadanos. No sé si es suficiente el tiempo o, o su merced de vida. Muchas gracias.
Tal vez ya, 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 ya podemos ir cerrando. Gracias. Muchas yeah. gracias, don Jesús. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists and their great presentations. We're going to move now to, um, we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you so much for your patience, especially for Milion, which is, uh, you are you are in a, a very, very late at home. <laughs> um, so we're going to move to questions and answers. If there is questions, uh, please, if you can use the chat to, to let us know. I think that the first question was for Milion and it was uh, about how to get the, the, the results of the study. If there is a way to, to get the results of the study that you mentioned, I'm trying to figure out here. Um, yes, I think um, I can even connect uh, the person who is asking with the organization which is doing this. Uh, it's called the Institute for Sustainable Development. So they can get much more information from that organization. Thank you. And for Bernay, it says, are the Inuit aware of the grasshopper effect pesticides and its impact in the North? And would it be possible to study a big and clean um, community on their cancer rate? I think there are a couple of few questions, but these are the two questions that, that we found. Um, I think you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you for the question. That's a good question and something that concerns us um, all of the time. Cancer is prevalent across many of our communities. We do, we do um, projects that are based off of what our members are saying need to be looked at. Um, we also do work at the Arctic Council level where there are a number of working groups and I don't know if you're familiar with the AMAP working group, but we have Inuit and others from ICC who are participating and looking at um, pollutants, who are looking at uh, persistent organic pollutants, who are looking at um, other forms of pollution and the effects on our health and the overall health of our ecosystem. And I guess you could say the position that we have in terms of in terms of our way of life and in terms of sustaining our culture is that there has to be a balance. There has to be a balance between um, living our culture, living in our land, and also a balance in how the resources are utilized. And so there is a happy medium, I feel like. And because of the economy that we have today and the lives that we live, we do have to, we still have to participate in the cash economy, if you can say that. At the same time, we're also living our traditional ways of life. However, um, our people are very keen to ensuring that whatever development happens, that it is responsible development. Um, but there is very much more to learn in terms of um, cancer and our people and the overall health of our environment. So thank you for the question. I hope that provided enough of an answer. Um, we are constantly looking at all, all of the pieces of our ecosystem and uh, what, what we're work we are doing to ensure its cohesion and that it is a healthy ecosystem. Thank you, Bernie. Um, okay, this is a question for anyone in the panel. What suggestions and advice you have for academics who want to co-produce research? What should we keep in mind as we try to build new relationships with indigenous communities? <laughs> I see some smiles. I, I, who wants to go first? Would okay. you like to answer? Too? Oh, Bernay, can you go ahead and then Tui? Sure. Um, so in terms of research that goes on in our homelands and in our communities, there is often 
a need to find a balance between what the interests are of the researchers versus what the interests are of our people. And this can happen through meaningful partnerships and relationships that are built. It is something that I want to mention also is that our people for a number of years, including in my lifetime, have had a lack of trust in terms of some of the ways that research had been done in the past and how uh, what was extracted, I guess, from our communities and the way that our, our knowledge becomes extracted or produced elsewhere. So a large part of successful research is also realizing that the research needs to be mutually beneficial and that the only way to find out what priorities, what research priorities our communities have is to either go to the communities yourself or um, form a relationship with them. Because even though I do advocacy work at the international level for Inuit, um, I'm not going to be the person to go to to determine if a research project on X, Y, or Z should be happening in a community. We do have um, we do have a presence when some of these questions are asked, and we do try to direct them, the questions or the researchers to the the right places of where they should go. Um, we have a number of member organizations that make up who at least ICC Alaska is, and also ICC International. And um, all of these channels are utilized in terms of communicating information from the community level to the international level or vice versa. I think one more thing I forgot almost to mention, I don't know, I might have, I might have said something about it or not, but um, I think it's important that also when we're talking about research and we're moving into this era of, um, partnering with indigenous peoples and building research projects together is a need to recognize that there needs to be equity for how the research is framed and how it is developed. So there is a role for indigenous peoples to bring their knowledge to that platform, to be informing research, to be contributing to the outcomes of research and largely as a result of that to the outcomes of decisions that are made that will affect our communities and will impact us on the ground and then later impact our food security. Thank you, Bernie. Tui, would you like to add? Just, just quickly, uh, and I totally support everything that Bernay said, and um, there's probably little more uh, that can be said. Uh, I, I think you would ask yourself why. Why why do you want to take, carry out academic research of Indigenous peoples in our way of life? And do you have an understanding of our ability to produce our own uh, papers and presentations and and the way in which our trad traditional knowledge um, can evolve and um, and my I only quickly my bias is um, let's not be too scientific about this you know because uh, the science is often being considered as you know in terms of a hierarchy of wisdom science here our wisdom here and and with the uh, 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 the need for our emancipation will be based on uh, the understanding that everything is rooted in our traditional knowledge and and the, how how can academia foster that and I'm sure it came from a, a good place that question so thank you thank you to Emilion. yes um, I was doing my, my as a research in the committees or in other committees, but uh, quite recently I read something which really hit me. And uh, it was saying that it's very, it's almost impossible for someone to go to another community and say that they know them. It's impossible uh, because our mind is framed in a different way. When we look at the world, we don't look at it 
in the same way. It's not that people are necessarily coming with a bad intention. Uh, Stewie was uh, um, referring to people have good intention, you know, understanding other people's life. But it's always the case, in most of the cases, that people who have passed through academic education, you know, through universities, think that they are better than the people that they are researching. There is they, always that uh, what they call epistemological superiority in their mind. Whatever you say, whatever you say, however humble, <laughs> whatever, there is that. It's very difficult. And the methodologies that you use are developed over so many years. And they come from a culture, a particular way of thinking, whether you like it or not. Whatever methodology that you use from the universities. So when the two meet, when two cultures, two ways of thinking, which are patterned in a different way meet, one assumes that they know. They, they live probably one year, two years, and they assume they know. But if you get a chance of going back to one community and again and again and again, you will be shocked that every time you go, it's like an onion. You know, you peel, there's another layer, you peel, there's another layer, you peel. It's impossible to know. Uh, it's a, a difficult question. It's very difficult to see that. Don't go and don't do research, but um, I think the question also includes, you know, what do you say? Well, what's your, uh, what, what's, uh, what should we keep in mind as we try and build a new relationship with indigenous communities? Keep in mind that it's almost impossible to know that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam. Jesús, eh, ¿pudo escuchar usted la pregunta? La pregunta, the question was, um, the question was, um, what do researchers need to keep in mind when they want to partner with indigenous communities? We're going to give Jesús a, a few minutes to see if we, he was able to, to catch the question. Alex Bin. Sí. Hay una pregunta que dice que, que a pesar de pedir permiso a la madre naturaleza, hay ritos también para la siembra del maíz. ¿Sí? Eh, hay una pregunta. No, no es esa la pregunta. La pregunta es si hay investigadores que quieren hacer trabajo en comunidades indígenas, ¿qué es lo que deben de tomar en cuenta? si quieren trabajar y servir a las comunidades indígenas. Sí, tenemos un grupo de investigadores, de investigadores y por eso necesitamos que, que nos organicemos, nos integremos para hacer investigación de los trabajos, sobre todo de las semillas tradicionales que en este momento se están perdiendo. Porque hay gobiernos de turno que, son, que nos están imponiendo las semillas transgénicas. Por eso es importante, aquí en, en Colombia hay cinco organizaciones indígenas y entre ellos hay profesionales interdisciplinarios que estamos tratando de fortalecer nuestra cultura, sobre todo eh, rescatando y conservando las semillas tradicionales, porque eso es lo que más eh, nos, y, nos interesa para que nosotros trabajemos en ese campo. Okay, and um, we are going to give chance for an, a last question. Um, it says, how can the non-indigenous best support strengthen the full sovereignty efforts of our indigenous neighbors? How can the non-indigenous best support strengthen the food sovereignty efforts of our indigenous neighbors? Tui? 
I thought I might answer first because my computer's running out. We're on solar here and it's the morning, so um, thank you to everyone if I do get cut off. Um, the I think what we're asking people to do, basically um, something that each person can do for themselves is be a mind, be mindful about when you eat food, uh, was, was an Indigenous farmer respected uh, in the growing of that food and getting it to market to you? And was Mother Earth also respected? Uh, and and um, you know, just these few small things that people can do um, will make a difference. Don't feel like you need to come into the indigenous community and and help us to rethink everything. But um, yeah, just that. Those are the things that we're asking people to do, and are here in Aotearoa, and to start speaking out about it, and 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 be the change. Kia ora. Thank you, T. Uh, we we have time for one more comment. Million or Bernie? Jesús. Eh, eh, corroborando lo que dice la compañera, yo creo que a los hermanos no indígenas tienen que tener una entera convicción, una entera convicción en qué terreno y en qué territorio va a ingresar. Y tener una entera sensibilización y sociabilización. Porque los hermanos indígenas, no indígenas tienen que adaptarse al medio y a las disciplinas alimentarias. Entonces, eh, ellos son bienvenidos. Porque caso contrario, los indígenas tenemos una disciplina. Una disciplina. Si no quiso comer la comida que nosotros le ofrecemos, prácticamente ese hermano no indígena va a echar mal. Entonces, mire, tiene que adaptarse al medio y tener una entera convicción o convicción si quiere eh, mantener la salud y quiere mantener la unidad y la familiaridad. Nosotros somos demasiado buenos, demasiado generosos, demasiado buenos, brindamos lo que haya, cualquier ciudadano que llega, le brindamos la chicha, le brindamos la sopa, la bichana, lo que nosotros decimos. Entonces, la persona tiene que, que estar preparado a, a adaptarse al medio en que se encuentra. Gracias. Gracias, Jesús. Eh, Bernet, last words, and then we're closing. Just a quick last remark, um, something that we often say non-Indigenous peoples can do to support Indigenous peoples livelihood or movements um, and in terms of food security and food sovereignty it would be to get familiar with our issues and why we have these issues and visit our website, look at our work, help us to promote our work and help our um, calls for action to be realized and do what you can do to move two steps forward, maybe in your circles or in your places of empowerment um, to help us collectively move forward and re just realize that a, a lot of the work that we are doing is not only for a job, but it is for the well-being and the um, security and cultural sustainability of our entire people that is much larger than just a project or um, one initiative. Thank you, Bernay. Milion, last words? Yeah, um, I think they, they can do two things. Uh, there's a lot of pressure coming to indigenous people, indigenous land, indigenous way of life. Is a lot of pressure. Uh, if they could support the indigenous people, indigenous communities in their fight against all these uh, powers, that would be excellent. And they can do that in so many ways. And the second is also to support their initiative, you know, the initiatives uh, that they have in their own community. Uh, indigenous people identified 
um, solutions if they could support that. I think that too would be fantastic. And I would say it was a fantastic night and I'm so happy to see so many of you. A really inspiring speech. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And it was definitely, for me, it's an honor to be talking and listening to different views around the world. Muchas gracias, Don Jesús, también por su presencia. Um, also, for everybody, we're going to be posting this, this uh, webinar in our, pay, in our Facebook page in our Facebook page uh, at Culture Survival, please take a look there. And also I'm going, just going to share the screen with the contact emails from the panelists. If you want to contact them directly, you can reach them there. So um, let me do that for us as the end. And thank you so much. And our thanks also to Mother Earth and the sun for the fall, because it's a time to harvest in the North and it's a time to plant in the South. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Galina. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a good night. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Muchas gracias, Jesús Antonio. Qué buena música. Sí, qué linda música. Qué linda, sí.